evening, everyone, and welcome to Anti-Racism Communities and Collaborations. My name is Yuma Toms, and I am the Horning Chair for Diversity, Equity, Access, and Inclusion at the Phillips Collection located in the nation's capital, Washington, DC. I wanna welcome you to this important and critical session on Indigenous art with Dr. Jolene Reichert, citizen of Tuscarora Nation, and Lisa Myers, Associate Professor of York at York University as part of the Anti-Racism Communities and Collaboration. Our session today is co-sponsored with the Phillips Collection and the University of Maryland um, Center for Literacy and Comparative Studies. You may find additional information at hashtag anti-racismUMD and hashtag CLCS underscore UMD. I will say three things by way of introduction to the series and then hand the proceedings over to the Phillips Collections Fellow, Mr. Gary Calcano. First, I wanna recognize with gratitude the vision and the energy of our colleague, sister, uh, Dr. Tita Chico, Faculty Director for CLCS and Dr. Karen Nelson, Director of Research Initiatives for CLCS. In addition to the graduate assistants who have worked on this project and our fellow for the Phillips Collection, Gary Calguno. The anti-racism playlist for this series has over 24 videos that you may find accessible on YouTube. Second, I'll note that our conversation today takes place in the context of two years of programming on anti-racism. This year, the conversation considers anti-racism through the rubrics of communities okay, and collaborations. The framing allows us to feature scholarship, teaching, public engagement that reimagine boundaries while working within a model of anti-racism inquiry and fostering collaborative relationships on and beyond campus. With this programming, we commit to art as a liberatory mode and a crucible of reckoning. The importance of community and communal histories, decentering whiteness, dismantling white supremacy, and refusing racism, and throughout holding up and honoring the knowledge work of Black, Indigenous, and other minoritized scholars and artists. Finally, we gather on Zoom. However, I want to acknowledge our indebtedness. Every community owes its existence and strengths to the generations before them and around the world who contributed to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will. Some were drawn to migrate to this land for hopes of a better life. Some have lived here for more generations than can be counted. Truth and knowledge are critical in building mutual respect and connections across all barriers of heritage and differences to honor those who come before us. The University of Maryland is located on a university campus built through the wealth extracted through slavocrats territory, slavocrats from the labor of enslaved black women, men and children. It occupies traditional territory of Anacostian and Piscataway people. This history is one that we are collectively encumbered to honor, recognize, and study. Likewise, the Phillips Collection rests on ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. We acknowledge that we have buried in honoring the truth. With this, I turn it over to Mr. Gary Calgalon, who will introduce our esteemed guest for the night. Wonderful, thank you, Yuma. Good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome. Um, as Yuma has noted, my name is Gary, and I am a Sherman Fairchild Foundation Fellow here at the Phillips. Um, I am delighted to introduce our two panelists for tonight's discussion. Jolene Rickard, who is a visual historian, artist, and curator interested in the intersection of indigenous knowledge and contemporary art, materiality, and eco-criticism with an emphasis on Haudenosaunee aesthetics. She is associate professor in the Department of 
history of art and art at Cornell University, where she was also the former director of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program. Jolene is a citizen of the Tuscarora Nation and a member of the Turtle Clan Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Jolene is joined by Lisa Myers, who is Associate Professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University in Toronto, Ontario. Um, she also holds a York Research Chair in Indigenous Art and Curatorial Practice. As a curator and artist with a keen interest in interdisciplinary collaboration, her research focuses on contemporary Indigenous art, considering the varied values and functions of elements such as medicine plants and language, sound, and knowledge. She is a member of the Beausoleil First Nation and part of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy. We also invite you, the audience, to post comments and questions in the Q&A um, following the session. Um, please join me in welcoming Jolene and Lisa. And my uh, internet is not very friendly today. And so Karen, if you could just nod your head and say that uh, my sound is coming through. Is it coming through, Karen? Because I can't see myself in this yet. Okay. <laughs> so I thought I would just, uh, thank you. I, I, I apologize about the uh, internet. Uh, we're we're going to do our best here today to share with you some ideas around uh, rethinking race uh, from Indigenous perspectives. And uh, uh, we're going to, um, uh, I thought I would begin with, if we could move to the first slide, please. I thought I would begin with maybe just a little uh, discussion about this broad category of race, which I'm sure you've already uh, had a number of people talk about the fact that there's just no scientific basis for race. And so then what are all the other ways in which uh, we arrive at this formation? Next, please. All right, so the first project that I just wanted to share with you uh, is uh, if we could go uh, to the next slide, please. Next slide uh, is this installation uh, back, back one, please. I wanted to reflect on an installation that I did for the National Museum of the American Indian at the inaugural opening of the Smithsonian's um, uh, Museum. And I did this in collaboration with Gabi Tayak, who is actually Piscataway and from the DC area, her people are from the DC area. And we did it in uh, the exhibit opened in 2004, and it had a long run. It lasted until 2014. Uh, for those of you that have heard me talk about this, you know that it was one of four or one of three um, permanent or semi-permanent exhibits in the National Museum of the American Indian. And that uh, this part of it was focused on the contemporary experience. And so this installation is really, if you could go to the next page, next slide, please. This installation is really a uh, demonstration of a relationship of all the indigenous peoples actually that have relocated to the DC area and the photographs were done in such a way as to act as a counter narrative to the construction of the stoic, noble, romanticized, native. Uh, at that period of time, of course, we've gone through a number of broad mappings of names, uh, American Indian, Native American. Uh, today, collectively, we often refer to ourselves as indigenous, but part of an anti-racist discourse is to actually identify our specific nation, uh, delineation or heritage of which mine is Skarura in my own language or Tuscarora. And so there was actually a little media piece in this installation that dealt with this notion of um, factionalization. Next slide piece, please. <clears throat> the, uh, this is the uh, sketch for the backside of the installation. 
and it details uh, are we in oh okay and it details the uh different kinds of issues that indigenous peoples in north america face in relationship to the settler state of the united states next please and so here are some of the issues that we're dealing with. This notion of, at the time, the language in play was who is native, who decides. This question of blood, the scientific determination of uh, quantification of the amount of blood as a way of determining your relationship. We actually found in the archive at NMAI a number of eugenics uh, surveys of which you see here in the green area. And we actually were able to be in touch with uh, contemporary indigenous families that their families were profiled as part of the this kind of determined uh, part of this different kind of uh, ways in which identity was being uh, determined. And so part of that was this discussion of appearance. Did you look native? And we had letters from the archive that showed that people were either accepted or rejected uh, being recognized by the federal government. And so in the United States, there is this process whereby indigenous peoples are either federally recognized or they're not. And it's called enrollment. And the actual enrollment is uh, something that we tried to understand from a legal perspective. And what we found, and this is something that was vetted by uh, the lawyers in the Department of the Interior, the lawyers for the Smithsonian, is that Technically, there really isn't um, a way that the United States determines uh, nativeness, and that is determined within each of our nations. But there is um, a larger framework which uh, recognizes if a people's a community is recognized by the federal government. And so, uh, like for instance, so this is what accounts for. The, the Cherokee Nation uses quantification or factionalization and does allow people to be citizens of their nation down to what's called a 32nd of the sort notion of blood quantum, where other nations have it at half. And I don't know of a nation that has it that full at this point in time, but so these, it, there's a very delicate interpret, like um, interpretation between the way in which people self-identify and then people are federally recognized. And so if we could go to the next slide. And so, so the federal recognition is actually quite, uh, quite serious because this is where uh, some of the treaty relationships kick in. And so from an indigenous perspective, uh, we look at all of the Americas as our homelands. And uh, we uh, do not think of ourselves as minorities within our own homelands. And so uh, we've always rejected this categorization of, my, of a minoritized populations because we are um, uh, within the center of our own homelands, but we acknowledge our relationship to uh, this ongoing structure of colonization of which identity and race are very closely um, embedded. And so we use our I use uh, artists as a way of bringing this point out in this installation. And so for instance, uh, across the face of the artist Halea Sinajan, who this is a graphic self-portrait, she has a number imprinted on her face. And so this number actually references this, the counting system that the Department of the Interior uses to register uh, indigenous peoples within uh, the enrollment system of the United States. And it's the same numbering system that's used within the Department of the Interior that also counts buffalo in the parks. It also counts uh, native peoples. Uh, it counts native peoples in the same way. So next, please. 
And so I use also, or I uh, brought forward the important and iconic work of James Luna, who's no longer with us, the artifact piece as a way of calling out this ongoing sort of uh, the way in which uh, indigenous peoples have continuously been represented within this kind of calcified historic past, this kind of frozen past. And, and that this idea that our bodies, our phenotypes, how we look, our blood, uh, all of these things become factors in the way the state, uh, the colonial state continues to recognize our experience. Next, please. And so I just bring forward the work of Richard Ray Whitman, who's Yuki Muskoki Creek. And in this piece, He's laying out the visualization of DNA, this idea of being uh, represented or cataloged to these kind of like censored tag numbers. And then he's provided his enrollment number over here on the photograph of this young indigenous person. And so, uh, and so I guess what, uh, you know, what I think I'm uh, interested in is thinking about the difference in this space between the United States and Canada as settler states, its impact on us as indigenous peoples and how these structures are still in place. And so when we talk about race for indigenous peoples, um, I'm sharing with you uh, in a very quick way <laughs> Uh, and uh, the fact that we're dealing with these structures that uh, are imposed in our communities, but that we have to acknowledge that many peoples in our communities uh, have accepted these structures. Uh, and I think the artists that we're looking at today are in some way challenging the st structures and their work begins to raise awareness of uh, the opportunity to rethink or decolonize the structure of race as perhaps a non um, a non future uh, a, a non indigenous future category, and so uh, with that I'd like to ask Lisa if she might uh, share some thoughts with us and uh, turn turn the discussion over to Lisa for a few minutes here. Thank you. Thanks, Jolene. I um, appreciate that. Um, and it's really valuable to understand more about the systems, um, the structures and systems that, uh, that uh, impose, but also have a determining effect on identity and in the United States. Um, I am, I guess you can move to the next slide. I'm, I, you know, there's a in Canada, we have uh, we're um, uh, colonized by the British and the French, and um, with a heavy uh, sort of through that through those through those uh, processes, uh, the British uh, uh, became dominant. In um, so there's also this um, and through the uh, the imposition of the. Indian Act, uh, which is uh, legislation law that um, governs uh, enroll, well, I guess, um, members of uh, um, First Nations uh, band members. So the Indian Act was established in 1876, and it was had a number of um, amendments over the years. It was, of course, um, seeped in and uh, very much uh, perpetuated um, white supremacy with the assumption that um, First Nations people, uh, indigenous people here in Canada uh, were based on the foundation or the foundational sort of idea that um, indigenous people were inferior. And the strategy of the Indian Act was to assimilate to divide uh, people um, uh, upon, on reserves and to um, divide that collective strength. Um, and uh, it was extremely patriarchal as well in terms of uh, 
um, within the, the laws if, if, a, if an Indigenous woman or First Nations woman married a uh, non-Native uh, non man, um, she would lose her status. So it's a status, um, Indian status is uh, determined through the Indian Act. And the Indian Act um, is, governs, a, governs over um, First Nations um band councils we have band council structures so that's a little very short um explanation of something that's extremely complex and i um i, I just think that that context is important in this conversation but i wanted to just um i wanted to just sort of segue from your talk uh with with some of that but i also want to just take a minute to, to say miigwech uh, jolene for inviting me to join you for this talk and also miigwech to the and thank you to the university of maryland for hosting such an important series and and i'm really honored to be here and i so i wanted to um continue this uh sort of giving offering some perspective or things i've been thinking about in in canada in this Canadian context, the land we know is Canada, um, and considering three artworks from two shows that I curated at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery here in um, Ontario, in Kitchener, Ontario. Um, it's a public gallery that I've worked quite a lot with. And so I did these two shows. One is called Carry Forward, which was about documents, documentary, and documentation manifesting in artworks, and considering how how knowledge is transferred through um, through these these more material forms uh, of, of documents, uh, but I also included um, reference to wampum and um, uh, yeah, wampum was one of the other items that were, so were I was sort of contemplating through this, but um the works and then the other show that uh, has one artwork in this talk uh is from postscript so the the show carry forward was about documents and documentary and then uh, a follow-up show which is a shorter show a shorter run show postscript um was uh, a show that unfolded over a month where one artwork was added each week and in that show um rather than depending on the pages of a document i thought about um introducing elements um that are uh that carry knowledge and and um so thinking about voice thinking about uh, medicine plants thinking about cedar thinking about water and so uh brought together artwork artworks by luke parnell susan blight rebecca belmore and melissa general and in uh carry forward I, it was a larger show with um nine artists, uh, Maria, Maria Teresa Alves, uh, Marjorie Bocage, Deanna Bowen, Dana Claxton, Brenda Draney, um, John Hampton, Jamili Hassan, uh, Mike McDonald, Nadia Mir, Christabel Stewart, and Mika'i Tubbs. And so I'm just going to talk about a few, but I just wanted to acknowledge those artists. Um, so uh, I'll just, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'm just starting with uh, Susan Blight's work, um, this work which involved, uh, which includes the, a, a plant, the bearberry plant, uh, an important medicine plant uh, from her home territory and also from areas around northern, on, northern Ontario, her home territory being in Treaty 3, which is northwestern Ontario, um, north of, uh, lakes, northwest of Lake Superior. So, with, I'm thinking about this berry, uh, bearberry plant, which is uh, which is a medicine which would be um, uh, important in terms of sustenance in in times of of a famine. Um, important in terms of a, a medicine for every day, uh, for everyday um, teas and things. The the and then the the word the text on the wall we will be heard. Um, what was I thought was interesting about this or important about this was in conversation, especially with the large megaphone piece, which is um, an artwork by Rebecca Belmore and, and iconic as well, I would, I would argue, uh, Ayami Awach O Mama Moen, which is speaking to their mother. And this was a piece that she made that um, was that Rebecca Belmore made in 19... Um, 92 and or 1991 and it was after the the so-called oka crisis 
um, the Ganasatage uh, resistance, where uh, the state, uh, the army was called in when um, uh, Haudenosaunee or Mo Mohawk people were defending their lands and le defending the land from a, a Gulf development. And this really was a moment where and I think it's really important, mo extremely important moment in Canada, because at that point there was um, not only a military calling out against uh, the uh, indigenous peoples here, but in First Nations, but also that it, it, it created a, since I was alive at the time, I recall that summer, there was a lot of racial tensions, um, a real, lot of anti-indigenous uh, um, actions of just among citizens. There was, uh, there were even, you know, documentation in the documentary by um, uh, Elanisa Bomsawin, it documented the, uh, the, the violence and the, the, from like citizens of Quebec against um, elders and children that were being brought out of those protest sites. And so this was a this was a artwork that was brought to different communities to speak to the land directly to 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 um, for, for people to be able to speak to the land directly. And so I was thinking about how land um, and these this piece by uh susan blight how that is so valuable in terms of thinking about um how, who's listening and how how those relationships the relationship to land um reinforces a kind of outside of canadian law it reinforces uh our 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 bond with our traditional territories with uh, a connection to um yeah, a reinforcement of our connection to our traditional territories where within Canadian law and and that being also part of the Indian Act within Canadian law occupancy of um, territories is something that has to be proven by even um, uh, First Nations who are very already reassured and know who know that their, their traditional territory our traditional territory so. So this is something that I think there's a sort of a, a sparking point there where the where that time in 1990 that summer of 1990 where tensions uh, where racial tensions uh, came to the surface um, the always existing, of course. Um, always existing always um, a lot of tensions between um, a lot of anti indigenous racism in Canada. Um, I think that moment is is where I was thinking about how um, occupancy and land is connected to to uh, perceptions of race and and also connected to white supremacy. Um, and so, if you want to move to the next one, that'd be great. But this this work in, in in terms of this discussion, I am kind of using this work in a you know I'm talking about this work in a particular with a particular lens. But I I want to reinforce that. Um, you know, this work has uh, is um, it's it's it reminds us of of survival, um, the survival through you know knowledge of of medicine plants uh, of um, of the sustenance that comes from our territories, but also um, how important listening to uh, all living beings is in in the sense, and so I think that. Um, uh, Laura, I'm um, sorry, um, Susan Blight's work um, here, uh, symbolic of survival, and 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 that is um, that is also navigating uh, the conflicts and and uh, also the Canadian law um, through through the different challenges that come up, and I'll talk a bit more about that. So the next slide, please. Um, and with this next slide, I'm changing, changing gears a little bit, but this was another, this was a work in Carry Forward, which, uh, which was in, which was a, um, the one show that I mentioned. And I saw this um, work by Deanna Bowen in a, a show of hers, a solo show of hers called Invisible Empires. Um, and when I saw it, I was over, overwhelmed by its, um, well, its, its presence in the gallery of its of it as a document um, which I consider a document of settler indigenous histories but also settler like um, black and black histories as well and and I, I was thinking about um, how um, 
so I'll tell you the story of it. <laughs> so this is uh, the 1911 Anti Creek Negro petition from immigration of Negroes from the United States to Western Canada, 1910 to 1911. And this is uh, from the national, this was found by Deanna, who does a lot of archival research in her work. And this was um, unearthed from the uh, archives in Canada. And it's a 234 page uh, petition um, that inscribes uh, lists of signatures affirming and disclosing a racist and exclusionary action against Black Muscogee Creek people who migrated north from Oklahoma to Edmonton, Alberta during the time of um, a lot of people were, a lot of um, Black families, communities were um, moving north. Uh, um, because of Jim Crow law, because of the segregate of segregation and uh, all, all the material um, fallout from se that, you know, such as poverty and other things. But this, so this, um, this shows a kind of a migration across the border, across the line. Um, and, and in this, uh, there were communities set up around Edmonton, uh, mainly black communities by, by a lot of the folks that came north. And um, this uh, shook the the um, stability, I guess, or um, of of white uh, of the white supremacy within Edmonton, and and brought forth this huge document of signatures. And um, this uh, so fifteen percent of Edmonton residents signed this document at the time. So this was nineteen ten. And uh, it was presented to the Prime Minister, Sir Wilfrid Laurier at the time, and um, and so this was a, a part of a protest against the migration of uh, Black Muscogee Greek people from Oklahoma, and um, and the result uh, was an order in council was drafted to change immigration policy more officially. And it wasn't passed. This was not passed because uh, the prime minister was concerned about tensions with the American government. So instead, he instituted a really racist exclusionary procedure of um, of a profiling at the border. And also not only profiling, a lot of the this is not just one um, Canadian uh, racist immigration uh, action or policy. Um, there are many and, and a lot of them had to do with finance too so how much money you would have so it had to do with profiling a medical sort of profiling of people's um, appearance but also how much money they brought in how much money they would have so it was economic in that way as well and so um, this was an era that also Deanna Bow and the artists um, ancestors had migrated to uh, and created and was part of the founding of a community called Amber Valley and so these this document, I think, is really important in terms of Canadian history and also Canadian art history, because the signature of Barker Fairley, who was this, uh, extremely close and associated with the iconic group of seven, which is, you know, uh, many have constructed the Canadian art history as 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 group of seven as the foundation. So uh, that kind of reinforcement of white supremacy within um, Canadian art history, I think, is reinforced through this document too. It was it happened that the registrar at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery came across that signature of Barker Fairley, which was a huge, uh, amazing thing that came about through this exhibition, um, and also is something that Deanna Bowen has taken on with her art practice. But I think one of the things that that is that this this document reinforces is that um, it dispels the notion of Canada as the as the um, as the safe place uh, away from the U.S. that that racism that um, enslavement that um, that uh, segregation existed here as well and so um, I, I we can move on to the next um, slide and here's some details of it you can see the signatures some of them have great flourish and are very emphatic about what they're signing for <laughs> I could would interpret anyway and if you want to go on to the next one um, I'm going to finish off here with uh, some work that is by the um, late Mi'kmaq artist Mike McDonald um, he's an uh, artist that I've been looking at his work for quite a while and I'm curating a show that's opening in the spring at, again at the Kitchener Water Art Gallery that looks at his, at his work and we're, I'm looking at this work Seven Sisters and 
the reason, one of the reasons I wanted to just talk about this is it relates back to um, uh, proving Aboriginal title to land, which is part of um, if people, if uh, First Nations challenge the the govern the crown or uh, the government for, um, well, uh, Mike McDonald worked with the Wet'suwet'en and the Gitsan um, tribal councils during their challenge of uh, challenge to the uh, Crown or the British, uh, British Columbia and the federal government for Aboriginal, t first of all, for ownership over their land. But then they realized that ownership meant something different in Canadian law compared to what they thought ownership meant. So it, they, they switched tack and they sued for or challenged for Aboriginal title of their land. And so um, in doing so, they had to prove their occupancy and Mike McDonald, and so Mike McDonald worked with them to, as a video artist at the time, a videographer, a documentarian. Um, not everyone had a phone to document things at that time in the late 80s. So he documented elders' testimonies for this court cases, testimonies that would be uh, submitted as evidence of the occupant, their occupancy and their bond to their territory. Um, and this was a, a long case, took 10 years, and it was called the Dolgamut case, which changed Canadian law, um, uh, some aspects of Canadian law, one of them being accepting oral history as, as, um, as evidence. So, um, and also clarified within our constitution what Aboriginal title meant, um, because it was mentioned in our constitution, but it wasn't clarified in detail. So anyway, Getting back to this work is this is um, if you want to move to the next uh, shot, that would be great. Uh, the next yeah um, so this uh, is a shot of uh, from a helicopter um, this uh, seven sisters, which is a mountain range within the interior of British Columbia on um, get sand territory and the the video changes the videos change it's in different composition to uh, shots of clear cut forest on the mountain ranges to um, taxidermy wild uh, woodland wildlife in the museums uh, in a museum in victoria bc and um, and i think part of part and then there's a song that that a song that is sung over top by uh, chief mary johnson who is who is a who's a hereditary chief who this song represented um the bond this this song was submitted to um as evidence in the court which was not heard by the the, the um the judge and and in this so in this process of learning about this court case and learning about these things um, and learning about thinking about uh, indigenous law and Canadian law, I think what comes comes forward in, in a sense is is um, is the clash of two systems um, and but but very much having uh, in what we were talking about these structures that we we live under or live within um, currently um, so these uh, this clashing of these these structures and I would say um, again brings forward this uh, this idea that um, that I talked about earlier where uh, tensions when it comes to tensions around land or tensions around resource extraction and money that is related to land that um, there's a strong anti-indigenous uh, backlash and that um, indigenous identity or rate I would I would argue that this it's a racism that comes through and that that it's entwined with it is entwined with um, the uh, the economics and the uh, the material, I guess, gain of land. So I, I'm 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 going to leave it there because I think I might have taken up a lot of time. But I, I just sort of wanted to throw those ideas together, throw those out there to think through. It's it's relating a lot to um, just these two shows and the things that I'm continuing to think about with uh, Mike McDonald's work. Um, and so I guess we can maybe open it to uh, um, more conversation um, and I'll finish there. Miigwech. Great. Thank you. That's a, a wonderful um, leeway. And thank you again, Lisa and Jolene. That's so many, so much to unpack in, in such a short amount of time. 
Um, but I do want to open again to the audience. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat box or the Q&A segment. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, but as we wait for any comments to come through, um, one thing I'd love to know is um, the Abbey Museum in Maine, for example, offers a move of decolonizing work um, saying, quote, at a minimum, sharing authority for the documentation and interpretation of Native culture. Um, do you think decolonizing work operates differently in the context of an art museum specifically and the treatment of work versus cultural object versus artifact? What sort of considerations might be made in an art museum context that maybe other institutions may not be aware of or, or we may not think of. Um, I think I might add to your question, Gary, that it was important for me to include a North American perspective. And so having Lisa bring to the discussion some of the subtleties between these two settler states becomes, I think, really important in this discussion. Because through this comparison, we can begin to really see the sort of architecture of the structure of colonization. And so one of the observations that I make is that within North America, we're having a discussion about anti-racism. But I would argue that until we have a discussion about decolonization or the impact of colonization, of which, you know, and I, I don't want to get into a semantic debate here, but I would argue that racism is nested within colonization. And so until we can really begin to get at the system, that systemic structure of colonization, I don't think we're going to really effectively be able to deal with uh, the kind of factionalization that is caused because of the uh, imposition of race. And so one of the things that I particularly loved about um, or, or respected about Lisa's presentation is bringing into conversation uh, the Muskogee Creek and a, a, a observation because a number of indigenous peoples uh, had very, um, had long standing relationships with enslaved Africans before we were all pushed, all forcibly displaced from the American Southeast and East. And so to bring that story forward, I think is really critical at this juncture to really see, you know, because it's so easy within the race discourse to, uh, to separate us. But uh, you know, we were all equal, we're all impacted by it in different ways, and and so to one of the things like one of the contemporary terms that we didn't bring up is this whole situation with the land back uh, experience because um, uh, there's there is a kind of uh, scholarship that's happening in indigenous space where we're looking at uh, different protocols as a way of rethinking indigenous and settler and arrivant relationships because not everybody is a settler in North America. Many people are here because they were forcibly displaced from their own homelands. And so opening, I think, up that awareness and how we can have those discussions is there were just so many, I think, generative uh, uh, places in what Lisha shared with us and uh, that I'm not really sure for me how I can really distinguish the object in the museum from this broader discussion. But uh, I'll let Lisa take this one on too, because I'm sure she'll have a, a more uh, interesting take on it. I don't know about that, but thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think, thanks, thanks a lot. I think that bringing Deanna Bowen's work into the conversation really shows the complexity of these, these things that these sort of identities or this, the way that uh, the taxonomy of race, you know, uh, keeps people separate or separates people, I suppose, I guess separates. Um, but, and also then, you know, 
Um, so I think that that's really important. And I think that the question about settler and arrivant and um, is something I'm trying to think through too. Uh, so maybe we can talk more about that. But uh, just flipping back to the museum specifically, I guess my first thought was, I appreciate what you're saying, Jolene. I, my first thought around the museum and thinking about work of decolonization is, is the sort of, is the, <laughs> well, I guess acknowledging that it is a space that was originally created to discipline, you know, I'm, I'm kind of for that Foucault, Foucaultian kind of idea of disciplinary, the disciplinary space and, and the, a, a kind of colonial space of, of the museum. Um, and, and that that is, so for us to, to for us to enter us as, as, um, uh, I guess indigenous curators um, or Anishinaabe curator and a Tuscarora curator, um, I think that uh, there's a navigation of the institution, there's a kind of questioning of systems, but there's also sometimes a kind of like you feel like you get pulled into that too. So I think that I pulled into the system of, 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 of um, and so it's an of, of the museum as a kind of colonial project. Um, but I think that um, in through decolonization, it's, it's a kind of call for re reform or remediation of the of the institution. Um, and I think that that happens through the diff different practices. It, I don't think it happens entirely through what artists we bring in or only it's I don't think it's isolated to what artists are brought in what uh, what work we do together in that those spaces, but it's, it's how we how we um, how we push the sort of limits and boundaries of the of their systems, I think, and that is a is a is a challenge. Um, um, I wanted to just this is something that maybe relates to that question too. Sorry, I'm just thinking about Deanna Bowen's work and how the finding of the name of this artist who was associated with the group of seven Barker Fairley in this specific example for Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery, they actually had work by that artist in their collection. And so, or they do still. And so, you know, when something like that is uh, brought to the surface, um, that, you know, this artist's name is on this petition, this anti black, uh, anti indigenous document, uh, then what is the responsibility of that uh, institution to? Uh, how do they take care of that? How do they respond, right? And I think like little things like this that happen when you come into a space, when as a curator I come in and and we and an artist as the artist comes in and their work does something like this, because I would say the artist's work did something like, you know, that is the the spark point. Um, that is a point of like uh, of potential um, for de decolonization, but and also for a self-reflection of the institution of like, how, what do you do with this? What are you going to do with this now? And what is art? What is Canadian art history going to do with this? Because I think a lot of people don't want to don't want to face that because they're very comfortable with the construction of Canadian art history as being the group of seven. And anyway, so I think those things are are excitingly um, unsettling. Um, anyway, <laughs> so no, if there's any other questions. <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting because in the United States, uh, because I do work in an art history uh, program that actually produces future educators in art history. Uh, it's interesting that we're involved with a project of um, first having to identify multiple modernities, because unless we really mm. uh, complicate the era of uh, the, mul the this moment of modernity, we're not ever going to be able to reset the uh, markers of the kind of, um, you know, and it's interesting because there's, I think, a backlash. Uh, you, you use the word backlash around this discussion of Oka, uh, uh, what happened at Gunasatage, and, um, you know, the, and it's happening again. I'm thinking about uh, the work of Ellen Gabriel and how in uh, Gunasatage, they're faced again with encroachment of their land. And, and it's as if the clock reset to 1990, where they're again having to defend uh, the encroachment on their territory, the pines. And I'm thinking about in the last administration, how so many 
indigenous nations were take were moved from being federally recognized to being erased as indigenous peoples in the and United States in the United, in States. The United yeah. States yes right. and this is like a this was like a planned kind of action and so the idea that our space in our own homelands is stable i think is is something that needs to be acknowledged that it is not stable and that we are constantly having to assert that this is our place in the world you know and what do we mean by that i mean uh, there's been a kind of embrace of indigenous ideals there's a new extraction going on and the extraction is let's look at indigenous epistemologies let's look at indigenous worldviews let's look at indigenous notion of the natural world let's extract that but not acknowledge it and move it into the environment and sustainability discourse and so so this is the latest form of extraction because they because the there's a kind of you know space and settler space that they already feel so comfortable with the fact that access to our land the physical piece of it but now there's this kind of like conception this ongoing conceptual extraction and so you know uh i think you know once in a while we get a little space in in the university or a little space in a gallery and and i think you know i I've always felt the artists from our communities are leading this category called uh, indigenous futurity, uh, which is looking towards uh, rethinking our place, this, you know, even place to use that word, but I meant like our relationship to place mm -hmm. is, is um, you know, we, we're always kind of like taking an opportunity to try and create you know and sometimes i think about what are we trying to create what is this what is this place that we're trying to create are we trying to you know just you know there was this moment of survive right for a long period of time and then uh the um uh you know gerald visner then kind of shifted that term and in the 80s came up with this notion of survivance you know, which is a kind of co the combination of both survival and, you know, this idea of active, uh, the, this idea of active exuberant survival. And he used this idea of survivance. And so we've kind of eclipsed that and we're using this language of indigenous futurity today as a way to signal resurgence, as a way to signal re-traditionalization re or traditionalization. And this is where, you know, the, the, image of the bear berry plant i think you know is profound and it's easy to kind of overlook i think the significance of that work as well all of the work that's going on that's kind of just continuing to mark our presence the work that's kind of for us that's teaching us about what's significant what's important well at the same time <laughs> we're always having to defend even a place to do this work. And so I, you know, I, I think, you know, some peoples have taken their work, their resistance to the streets because they've had no other choice, you know, and that's where I think the Black Lives Matter movement came in. This is where No Dapple came in with, a, you know, defense against the pipeline through uh, important aquifers and homelands and and uh, the anti-Asian aggression that's happening. It's like, it just makes me question, why is this still happening? You know, and, and, and what is it we're missing about the levers of control? that continue to create these, um, these, this hostility, right? Because it's, you know, racism is hostile. And, and, uh, and so this is where I feel like we're all trying to grapple with what's going on. And then I have to say, then all of a sudden this war between, you know, Russia 
you know, with Russia coming forward and, you know, where's the world's humanity to just let this happen? And with, with all of like, it's, it's like, I'm confounded. Like, why didn't all these first world nations create a mass kind of protection or exodus of these people so they just weren't bombed. And there's so many places in the world that this continues to happen. And yet, you know, we all act like we're, you know, innocent or we act like we're not able to do anything. And, and so the, the gross, you know, the grossness of that action is, is really part, I think, a, an extension of this system that we're discussing right now. And, you know, the, the small, what, what one may think of as a small infraction of a signature by the, you know, the, the, the group of seven. And the fact that most people in art history may or may not be familiar with the group of seven, but that it's a, a kind of canonical space within, you know, settler space in, in North America, in Canadian history, you know, and the United States, we don't have something that's like marked in this way, but I would argue that all of the early landscape painting and, photo and photography that was done in the 18, uh, 19th and up into the 20th century, we can look at much of that work as imagining or dispossessing, dispossessing indigenous peoples and imagining then an American space. And so, you know, it's not inappropriate to discuss through art because art actually provides these very revealing markers about what we're thinking or perhaps projecting. And so, yeah, and dispossession of land and imagining the American space or the Canadian space is extraction. Like it comes back to that extraction. You're thinking about, you know, thinking about the bearberry plant as, um, as, you know, this important, important sort of, we could talk about survivance, um, thinking through it. But uh, I was thinking about, I heard um, Susan Blight speak um, just the other day, uh, I was sitting on a, a, a jury with her and she talked about the thinking about like what you're talking about, uh, the, the extraction for, um, for sustainability and environmentalism kind of discourse, like uh, indigenous ways of knowing and epistemology and knowledge. Like I feel that so strongly. And what yeah. something that Susan said was that, um, you know, the the debt of um, or sort of the citational sort of the need for cit citing people around right. in medicine plants and things like this indigenous people because so much was stolen. So much of that knowledge was stolen and then re you know kind of uh, distributed in different ways, but um, I think that 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 kind of extraction is is just as significant as like. Mm -hmm. um, the, the movement of no dapple of like the extraction from of resources and that that and I think mm -hmm. I'm not yeah and so I think it relates so much you know materially like it, it that material material aspect of colonialism or ongoing colonialism is or colonization I should say is um is like such a huge factor in this which it which is it which is a huge factor in what you were asserting about, you know, race and uh, colonialism being nested within each other. Yeah. Um, anyway, I just, I just wanted to like pick up on that, but I think I really appreciate uh, you touching on uh, all the um, on those all those aspects of of, of this discussion. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and and the other point of this, of course, is about the legal relationship because. Uh, the 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 Dalgamet case of using oral mm -hmm. testimony and the work of uh, 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 McDonald in you know I mean when you think about the beautiful transit of this you know that and then this work was done in the eighties you know it was really ahead of its time as far as because you know as you said because media wasn't as present then 
And so to use, uh, and it's interesting because it, it, it was, I think, very, um, you know, it was very present as far as seeing the word. And so it brought in the oral history. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, one of the struggles, continues to be one of the struggles in the arts today that, uh, that for indigenous art, it has this, often it has this multi-sensory demand that it isn't just about the object, but that the object can have multiple sense, can be a multi-sensory experience. And then it laces into the legal system in that case, you know, that this, that these testimonies actually then show up or are a part of the legal system is I think a kind of extraordinary thing, you know, that, that, you know, one of the things I, I, I always say to my students is that you really can't do native art history or indigenous art history, unless you take a few, uh, federal Indian law classes, because unless you understand the legal space of indigenous relationships to the state, you'll have a really difficult time in reading a number of these works, because th this is the structure that they're uh, responding to or resisting. And, and it's, um, and federal, and federal, uh, Federal Indian law, which that's what it's called in the United States, is, uh, you know, it's actually, of course, not our law, but it's the way in which we've been entrapped yeah. in these systems, you know, and so <clears throat> that's so art that, and law. <laughs> that's, yeah, that is really re, I didn't know that you taught that particular idea to your students because <laughs> in doing this this work and looking at McDonald's work, looking at a lot of the work, I've had to look at law and a lot. I've had to learn a lot. I'm not a law scholar at all, but, and then I've just met a colleague who is in law at, at York University and he's taking a curatorial course because he, because of the way that art, uh, indigenous art is um, so much he uses indigenous art in his, his law classes, which is, which kind of blew my mind because I felt, I felt like it was a lot of it was a lot of work to to sort of figure out and and I want to just say just to say that although the Dalgamut case made oral histories um, uh, you know uh, uh, admissible as evidence um, I would say that in that case it, the, the 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 judge didn't hear the song and he and that it was it was not an easy thing to um, you yeah. know that it's still not a, a perfect mm -hmm. uh, situation but. Um, definitely, yeah, Aboriginal title has been sorted out and also duty to consult mm -hmm. was another um, part that it changed Canadian law through that Dalgamut case. Yeah. And the duty to consult also right. is still up to, so like if industry or Canada is, is going to impose on uh, First Nations territory then, which is basically all of Canada, but we... <laughs> right. Yeah. And so there's a duty to consult. If, yeah. Yeah. And so, but it, it raised our consciousness about those issues, I think, even mm -hmm, though yeah. it didn't, as you say, make it to the, um, to the uh, seat of uh, the law or dismantle the law. But maybe, is this the right time, Gary, to ask um, the audience, your audience if they had any questions or? Um, I hate it's to obvious cut the Lisa, that. <laughs> We talk too long. And I can't <laughs> there's yeah there's so much i um it looks like we didn't get um questions or comments through the chat and unfortunately mm -hmm. i hate to cut this this engaging conversation short but we are past seven o'clock but i i encourage people to to go look all of i mean i'm gonna look all of this up and i'm gonna like read all about this and and try and engage us mm -hmm. more because i this is so illuminating and i can't Thank you, Lisa and Jolene, so much for for joining us and, and giving us your time um, and, and sharing these oh. these inspirances. So, I mean, there's lots of, of work to to do in, in dismantling white Whoa. supremacy and, and all of this. So, um, but I really Whoa. encourage the audience to, to look at that. 
Well, thank you for opening up some space for Indigenous dialogues and perspectives on this. And we really appreciate and thank you for Lisa for joining me in this discussion. I really, you know, feel that, you know, you really help to expand uh, our awareness in, in so many ways and uh, in, Thanks so in much. lots of different ways. And, uh, and very nice to meet all of you. Yeah, nice to meet everyone. Yeah. yeah, thank you. It was uh, it was really fun. And I'm sorry. I wish we could keep talking because I think I know. Fun. It's just <laughs> like I've got all these other ideas. So anyway, here we are. <laughs> this has been an extremely riveting conversation, and I just welcome the audience to please join me in a virtual applause of gratitude for our speakers, Jolene and Lisa, for joining us tonight on this enlightening conversation. Um, before thank I close, you. I'd also like to thank Gary for moderating tonight's program, as well as the Phillips Collection for their collaboration on this important conversation that we've had tonight. To keep the conversation going, please see the Anti-Racism Communities and Collaboration Series at the University of Maryland Center for Literacy and Comparative Studies website for additional programming there. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation in this evening and have a great night. Thank you again.